Okay, now we're moving on, we're looking at fossils, and how could the fossils have gotten there? Over a long period of time or catastrophic? This is in the question of which points better toward, uh, is it evolution or is it creationism? Recent creation or long period of time? Catastrophic or long period of time? Well, let's go back to the file that we're looking at, which is K33B. HTM, and we want to find the word hydro hi d r o d y n a m i c. It's an interesting word. Hydrodynamic. The hydrodynamic selectivity of moving water relative to fossil and sediment deposits. And it points to the flood, catastrophic flood. The other factor, tending to ensure the deposition of the simple marine organisms in the deepest strata, strata of the fossils, is the hydrodynamic selectivity of moving water for particles of similar sizes and shapes, together with the effect of the specific gravity of the respective organisms. Interesting. The settling velocity of large particles is independent of fluid viscosity. It is directly proportional to the square root of the particular particle diameter, directly proportional to particle sphericity, sphericity, and directly proportional to the difference between particle and fluid density divided by fluid density. So, Kremlin and Sloss in stratigraphy and sedimentation. These criteria are derived from consideration of hydrodynamic forces acting on immersed bodies and are well established. In other words, moving water or moving particles in still water exerts drag forces on those bodies, which dispend, depend upon the other above factors that we just uh, enumerated. Particles which are in motion will tend to settle out in proportion mainly to their specific gravity, their density and sphericity. It is significant that the organisms found in the lowest strata, such as trilobites, brachiopods, etc., are very streamlined and are quite dense. The shells of these and most other marine organisms are largely composed of calcium carbonate, calcium phosphate, and similar minerals, which are quite heavy. Heavier, for example, than quartz, the most common constituent of ordinary sands and gravels. These factors alone would exert a highly selective sorting action, not only tending to deposit the simpler, i.e. more nearly spherical and undifferentiated organisms, in other words, having no uh, amorphous shapes, near the bottom of the sediments, and but also tending to segregate particles of similar size and shapes, forming distinct faunal stratigraphic horizons with the complexity of structure of the deposited organisms, even of similar kinds increasing with increasing elevation in the sediments. So it's not the age of when the, that sediment was available to deposit, but the, the sphericity and density and shape it is not unlikely that this is one of the main reasons why the strata give a superficial appearance of evolution of similar organisms in successfully higher strata. The appearance of evolution of even such an important index file fossil as the trilobite, a microscopic shell-type marine life form with three-segment body, usually in a shell, is usually is really only superficial is evident from the recent presidential address of C.J. Stubblefield before the Geological Society of London, describing the origin of the various groups of trilobites as crypton, cryptogenetic, in other words, of obscure unknown origin. He says, the classification of trilobites has attracted much attention with far from conclusive results. A well-authenticated phylogeny, evolutionary life form classification system, 
of the trilobite class is still elusive. So they're still not decided what it, what it actually all means when they see it in the rock strata. Local peculiarities of turbulence, habitat, sediment, deposition, composition, upon would be expected to cause local variations in organic assemblages with each occasional heterogeneous agglomerations of sediments and organisms of a wide variety of shapes and sizes. But on the average, the sorting action is quite efficient and would def definitely have separated the shells and other fossils in such fashion as they are found, with certain fossils predominant in certain horizons. The complexity of such index fossils increasing with increasing elevation in the column is in, in at least a general way. So more complex as you rise up, but actually the more complex is less dense and less uh, spherical and, uh, and more amorphous in form. So, Clark and Voss, Genesis Research Laboratory. The paper entitled Fluid Mechanic Examination of the Tidal Mechanism for Producing Mega Sedimentary Layering, a paper submitted for the Third International Conference on Creationism, 1994. The shallow water tidal waves are perfect candidates for the role of sediment transport and deposition associated with the, the buildup of the layered sedimentary column. The global ocean in the tidal context is shown to be near resonance, which would augment the load carrying ability of the tidal waves. The geometrics of the Earth's sedimentary structures are characterized primarily by their tendency to lie in the horizontal position. So that's what if you, if you do this with a, in a jar of water and put all this stuff in there, you're going to get the same results. Take what you look at a uh, rock strata and look at the uh, uh, different uh, kinds of fossils and roll it all up and, and then stir it all up and then watch it settle. While many of the structures are now tilted and folded, the great bulk of them still exhibit that incessant horizontal character. This dominant feature is definitely attributable to the manner in which they were formed. Since water was the medium that carried most of the sediments into their present locations, and since the main geometric characteristic free of free surface water is its tendency to gravitate to the horizontal position, it follows that sedimentary structures should be dominated by horizontal tendencies. Let's see. A secondary characteristic of the sedimentary structures of their great importance is their conformal layering. Although many have sought to use this characteristic to give the structures excessive age, if you carefully consider this, a careful consideration of the layers and their contents will show that each layer must have been laid down within hours of the process preceding layer, hours, not millions of years, resulting in their witness to a very short period of time for the construction of the whole series of layers. <coughs> okay. Catastrophic, then. Fluid bodies can be moved by one or a combination of three mechanisms. Pressure gradients, gravitational attraction, and boundary movements. Of these three, gravitational attraction presents itself as the primary mover of a global ocean. Sir Isaac Newton's universal law of gravitational attraction, in other words, every body, every body is attracted to every other body with a force that is directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. This requires that the water in that global ocean respond to the bodies neighboring the ocean. The closest and most dominant neighbor to the global body of water would have been planet Earth beneath the ocean. This attraction is what would have caused the primary horizontal geometry of the water surface. The second closest and most and second most dominant neighbor would be have been the moon. The sun, although larger but farther away, but less has less than half the lunar influence. The gravitational attraction of the Earth, Moon, Sun system on today's oceans causes what we are called what are called the tides. Now, the bulk of the sedimentary structures forming the so-called geologic column can be attributed to the wave action of the tides in the global flood of Genesis. The tidal waves that occur in the oceans of the Earth today range from 1 to 2 meters, 1 or 2 meters, to more than 15 meters, depending on many factors. It should be noted that today's oceans differ greatly from the global ocean associated with the Genesis flood. Besides its different depth, on average about 2,400 meters compared to the 3,600 meter average depth of today's oceans, 
That ocean had no boundaries to interrupt the action of the tidal waves. Today's tidal waves operate in restricted basins of various sizes, some very large. But the tidal action is discontinuous, being stifled by the continental boundaries which form the basins. The continued continuity of the wave action in the global flood would have been especially beneficial in increasing the load carrying capacity of the tidal waves by augmenting their amplitude. Large wave amplitude is desirable because the ability of the wave to envelop, envelop, transport, and deposit large sediment loads is enhanced by the associated larger velocity fields. Waves get bigger and go faster. A second, perhaps crucial feature connected with the continuity of the wave action is the possibility that it would have been instrumental in developing resonance in the tidal action. So one, one wave enhances the other in going the same direction. Any cyclic system can develop the large amplitudes associated with resonance if certain criteria are met. If the, in the global ocean context, equality of the free and forced wave speeds is necessary. The free wave speed associated with the speed with which a disturbance would propagate in the ocean is dependent upon the ocean depth. The forced wave speed associated with the relative speed of the tidal bulge is dependent upon the rate of rotation of the Earth. Now we have the sedimentary structure of the geologic column. column. They offer excellent evidences for the limitedness of time. Less time, not a lot. The conformal layering without erosion marks between layers and the, in, the entombed and preserved fossils and skeletons and tracks, the extensive graveyards of intact plants and animals, as well as extensive graveyards of dissolved plants and animals in the huge gas and oil deposits, the polystrate fossil plants and trees spanning many sedimentary layers. They span a whole layer. They weren't deposited throughout millions of years. It's, it's a lot of water depositing. And the presence of meteorites only in the top layers of the column. All these push to the fore demand for a short period of time for the development of the column. Since the horizontal features the sedimentary structures require, in most cases, water as the means of deposition, and since the sediments are present over all the globe, even on the tops of major mountains, the thought vector points to a, the global ocean as the vehicle for their placement. This vector is consistent with the Bible and with other historical records of global ocean. Prior to the Darwin Revolution, the historical view of geography was based on catastrophism in conjunction with the universal deluge. The originators of these concepts were, for the most part, believers in the biblical record who were also of the field evidence and who made the connection between the two types of evidence. It is noteworthy that after a century of uniformitarian fa failures to explain the field evidence, Catastrophism is coming back into the vogue in geologic explanations. Now, three fluid mechanisms are currently being used to explain the development of sedimentary structures. Tidal waves, turbidity, turbidity currents, and tsunamis. A tsunami is a wave action generated by a sub-aquatic subterranean earth movement that causes a large-scale disturbance in the ocean water. Although a tsunami's effects may be felt halfway around the Earth, it has nothing to do with actual tidal mechanisms. The tsunami is a unique non-cyclic event attributable to a single unique non-cyclic cause. A turbidity current is also a unique non-cyclic event attributable to, uh, attributable to a single unique non-cyclic cause. A gravity-driven mass of sediment plunges down an incline, which entrains more sediment as it moves downward. At the bottom of the incline, the moving mass fans out as its momentum carries it over a possibly large aerial disp disposition, deposition plane. Tsunamis and turbidity currents are important in explaining small-scale localized depositions laid down in quasi-random fashion, but are inadequate in explaining the mega-layering which dominates the Earth's crust. Yeah, keep going back to that same old thing. It's not it. It's not adequate. Neither of these mechanisms has the worldwide scope and tremendous power of the true tidal wave. The Appalachian persistent facies of, is a geologic term attached to the larger mega sedimentary structures that tells the story regarding their extensive lateral range over whole continents in many cases. To attempt to explain the development of the layered column of mega sedimentary structures without a body of dynamically active water worldwide, as extensive as the persistent facies is illogical, 
The dynamism that in that global body of water must have come from omnipresent gravitational attraction causing the tides.